let me, first of all, let me... Leave you to it. Okay. Let me check that I'm getting your name right. Mrs. Korshed Italia? Italia. Korshed. K-H-O-R-S-H-E-D. Korshed Italia. And a very indelicate question, but tell me, when were you born? 1922, 8th of August. And how did you get involved in helping uh, abducted women? I... I just helped because I used to work as an honorary worker in the Harding Hospital. So all the volunteers that were volunteering at that hospital were asked to go to the old port and help the women that will be coming in the refugee trains or by trucks. So I was also one of them with the other workers. So on that first day that you were doing this work, where no, did you go to? No. The first day, you know, how, how these things happened was that uh, the shops started being looted over here. You know, all the Muslim shops were looted by everybody. And they broke, broke open the window panes and just take everything and the tonga and run, run. And my father was on duty in Pavra, so he phoned that, see, now I will not be able to come. And as things, and then Nehru came himself over here, you know, seeing things, I mean, somebody must have phoned him that this is going on. He came and he ran with us, with the lucky, trying to hit these Chokra boys. You know, they were got, they got into it also. You, uh, you saw Nehru yourself? Yeah, I saw Nehru by my own eyes from my balcony, from my balcony, running and catching. Then the police van came and everybody. Me, tell me again what you saw Nehru doing. Just Nehru running to control them. Okay, stop all this, stop all this, shouting, stop, Baskaro, 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 Baskaro. And he had a lati in his hand? Yeah, yet he had a lati in his hand. And then the police van came, and then of course, first they escorted him only. And then, but many shops were looted, many. So many, un and, and, uh, people used to just carry the material, you know, like that in hand, put it in Tonga and overload it up. Poor animal was not even able to carry the load that way. How they looted it. And then uh, a road from here, where we go to New Delhi station, that road was nothing but full of dead bodies, horses killed, people killed, and and I had to cross from Harding to that road. I said, I am not crossing this road. They said, we will have to do it. I caught hold of somebody, I'll, I'll faint here. Even then, we managed to cross and we went to Old Fort. And there, the first, the truck came with all women, old, young, middle-aged. And, and then first, we, and then whoever used to come, they used to write, give us the report that the, their wife is missing, the mother is missing, the sister is missing. So we kept on writing the names and asking where they were. And each time the women came, we had to ask, who do you belong to, what is your name, what all, all that. And then uh, the lady doctors who used to come, we used to examine them, whether they were raped or not, all that work we had to do. And when, when was this? Which month would this be? This is after partition? At the, the beginning when it started, when it started the, the commotion, when the actual fight started between Pakistan and India. I don't really remember the month. I've been trying to get that month out from yesterday, but I just can't. I just can't get to it. It was a summer month, I know that much. In, in June? Do you think it was June? Somewhere that side, May, June, somewhere, somewhere that side. So before this, before, before partition, when things started getting bad, 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 when it started, and then the, they had to give away, when they had to come, or Batten came, in, and then the twenty sixth was announced, and so on. But before that, the people here, the Muslim, there were many Muslim friends who helped Hindu friends. There were many 
Hindus who had their Muslim friends. Now a petrol pump opposite us used to belong to a Muslim. So he came running to my daddy. He says, you just take this pump. Give me any money you want to, whatever you can give me, and I'm getting out. I'm flying and tell your son-in-law to put me on the flight. I can get out of India. You know, there were so many people, so many became rich overnight. Overnight, you know. I'll give you this. You try to send me out from here. You, you take this jewellery, I'll send you out. Let us go out from here. There were so many people who became rich overnight. That way. And the women, when they and, arrived? And the women, they, when they arrived, they had made camps. And that time Delhi was not so huge, which is now. So naturally, we had made camps for every woman. And we divided the widow, the old, the young. And when the pound gave a mother and sister, then they were put together. Mother and daughter put together. Daughter-in-law, they were put in one camp. And that way, there were young girls, young girls, 16, 17. You know, you felt so bad. And then we had to give a certificate that they had been raped or not raped. And it was when it was just the beginning, then we used to just give injections and have them aborted. And some were in advanced stages. Some came very late very late, where they were at advanced stages. And then, when the men may have come from the train, once I was asked to go to the station to see to the train, the train, half the train had nothing but dead bodies. Nothing but dead bodies. Nothing but dead bodies. Oh, I just fainted at that day though. I just couldn't bear it and I, I asked them, I said, please don't put me to this work, I can't do it, I can never do it. They said, no, you just help us out for some time more. And then there were people on the roof, train roof, some, some were f fortunate, who came with, loaded with money and truck their things, their equipment. And some poor things only came with bundle of clothes the difference, how people came, how people left everything. There were rich people who just came with bundle of clothes and there were certain people who came with trucks loaded with their doctors, loaded with equipment. And uh, whenever we used to check, we first, our main thing to was to check women. If they needed shelter or help, then we would put them in the camp. And if they had somebody, then we would escort them to the address that they gave us. So, they were younger. And then a stage came when men came to ask for their women. This is, this was, uh, this is my wife. And the moment uh, he knew that she was pregnant, no, I won't take her back. And then it took months, time, to organize for these women to put them in teach them some sewing, teach them something where they would be. But they were women who themselves wanted to help us also. Mind you, they were not the women who would just sit and brood. They were the women who came and said, we will help you also, we'll help ourselves. Because at that time I would not understand a single word of Punjabi. So I would say, okay, now you ask, I'm as, as asking this, now you ask her and give me a reply, what she has to do and what she wants. And then she would say that she was raped here and there. She was raped by this, she was raped by that and then. And you could see, when an educated man came, he would not take his women back. Very few did. They said, no, we don't want them back. And mind you, a villager, would come and ask and say, well, it's not her fault, never mind, I'll accept her. And they took them. So it was the villagers who took ladies who were pregnant, caring, yet they took them. But educated men did not. And this is where they started 
more being prostitutes. They said, when we are considered that, we might as well lead this life. Now we don't care. So some, some, some of the adopted women some became adopted. prostitutes. They, they, they got frustrated when our husbands are not expect, accepting us. And they think that we are prostitutes, we might as well lead this life. We, we told them, I said, you can have a better chance. You start, we put you in this camp, do what you like to do. If you want sewing, if you want any work, we put you. And then you may, we may help you to get married. No, 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 finished. Life is finished for me. I am a prostitute now. What sort of tales did these women have to tell you? They were, they were really, they were really highly educated type, which I used to get shocked. I, I asked them, I said, how much have you studied? I've done this, I've done that, I'm a teacher. I said, you are a teacher and you want to lead this life. Why are you doing it? We'll put you, we'll put you in a school you can teach. No, no, no. This was the most sad part of life. I just couldn't, how we spent nights and days persuading these girls to change. Mind you, there were some young girls who were 18, 17. They, they changed. But girls, ladies between 30 and 40, they did not change. What sort of stories did these women tell you about they, what they had they, endured in they, uh, they said that we were, we were living in our house. They just came, looted us, dragged us, or raped us in our own house and threw us out. And there we managed to get into the truck and come here. There were some who came by train, many who came by, by the trucks, and people came and carts. Oh, it was a pathetic scene to see. It was terrible. And how I used to spend time working with these women and trying to persuade them. I said, we'll do everything for you. What will happen to this child? We said, we have a pumpling home. We'll put them there. No. No. They wanted to look after the children themselves? Perhaps. No, they were... I just couldn't fend them what was really, I mean, it. I suppose they were so upset and so, their mind was completely finished. I mean, they did not at that moment really know what they were doing. Perhaps after some time they, they may have realized that what they've done was wrong. But at that very juncture, their mind was in a very bad state. They were like mad women mad women and especially when her husband came and left her she really was mad we had to give them sleeping doors and put them to rest a little and try to be more attentive to them and first thing when women landed we had to take them to the camp first thing a doctor had to examine her what her condition is. Some were saved, old ladies were saved, and some old ladies were also raped. It, it's something which you can't believe, but it has been, and I have heard them own. Kikai, it's in front of my children I was raped. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? They would tell me. These things have happened. Oof. And how life was just terrible. And then there were some who were very nice, who took to things, they settled. And another thing, how Delhi has grown today, so big and so nice. These people never believed in begging. Though for the very time being we used to give them ration, everything, all the families that came, they were helped with but who came with money and who started doing their own work and building. So these other people, they helped and they paid these people. That is how people started 
earning. That is how. And then government gave them land, gave them little money to build. And that is how today Delhi is. There were so many women who came from Punjab. Many. Was it just a few who had been raped or was it a lot? Quite a good number. Almost 50 percent. 50 percent. Young girls were not spared at all. Young girls were very brutally raped. Actually, the vagina were torn. Very bad. Very bad. Oh, God. Sort of, some, you know, they used to, these women who had very bad uh, uh, vagina trouble, you know what they used to do? They used to put cotton with that term it. And, oh, God, <laughs> when I had to take the cotton out, I would just close my eyes. Ooh, and I would close my nose. And then I would, oh, I said, I can't bear it. And I was told, okay, now you take out the cotton. <laughs> I am not doing this. I can't think about this. Oh, blood. No. That was the dirtiest part of the work that many women had to do. And young girls were brutally raped. Very badly raped. They were, their life was completely finished. There, was a, there were young girls of 18, 19, who with their little children were there. Poor things. They, they, they said, you now what are we to do? Where do we go? Where do we go under these circumstances? They would ask us. What are we to do now? And there were some who said, all right, you treat us and we are on streets. How many of these raped women do you think were able to go back to their families? Most or just a few? Very few. The villagers took them, but not educated men took twenty five percent of the educated people took their wives back. Whereas fifty to sixty percent of villagers took their wives back. Even if they were pregnant? Yes. They accepted. And I admired them. A villager, a poor man, is more humble, has more mind to understand, but educated men, they have no brains. That's the way I judged. I may have been wrong then, but then after that, when things were settled and I, I was getting too, too worked up at all this, I just kept on feeling very, very bad. I couldn't bear to see it. Because then each time we registered, get this man came, took his wife, and then we would again go and see where they are, whether they are all right or not. You know, we had to go and see what they are really settled, or they've just taken little young girls. There were some people who wanted girls of nine, ten to be, to adopt, but then we had to go and see whether it is a real home or it's a brothel that they'll bring the girl up and then put her on that line. We had to make sure before we handed these children that were without anybody. Some children just came with no parents, nobody. They were howling, crying. So there were people who came forward to adopt, but then at the same time we could not give a girl for adoption. We were giving boys but not girls till we made sure that the family is good, or else we never get little girls of 9, 10, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 14. 13 and 14 were the most dangerous age, you know, where many people came from brothel houses to take these girls when they were 13, 14, when they found that they had girls who were 13 and 14 and good looking. We never gave them. We never handed them. Now, eight time we gave and we found out things. But this too, then all that we had so many volunteers running around the city, running especially the red light area to see whether, you know, some would stand half the way 
before Delhi and see and track whether there were girls of young, whether t- then they would take the girls and take them to brothel house. Then they were rescued. This type of a thing, even at that stage, the flesh trade was going on. And the women who came late in pregnancy, hmm. what would happen to their babies? Uh, it, they were given to foundling house. We have foundling house here. At, at that time also we had one. So of course we, the, uh, the government extended the place and they were put there. Very few chose to keep the baby? Some did and some gave away. They said, when we ourselves can't look after, what are we to do? Let the government take them. So they were handed over. You went through a lot. Mm-hmm. God. And trains, we used to go, go to train. I would refuse to go to a station. <laughs> I would hate that. I would hate it. Because we had to take the women, you know. We had to, our main aim was to rescue the women and see that they don't go astray. Because all these brothel people used to wait at the platform, trying to grab them. And we had to make sure that they are not taken away. So that is how it was. Which, which station was it the trains were coming in at? Old Delhi. Old Delhi. Old Delhi. Uh, the railway wouldn't inform the hospitals and all. Okay. The train is carrying all refugees. And some were with the families, were fortunate. They all came with the families. And they had a very nice, they, they were accommodated and very many came with the families. So, so when a train came in, how many workers such as yourself would be there to help the women? There were about over 100. For one train? For one train, 100. Even then we found that we were very few. And we had to make sure what we are doing. And we, we had to make sure whether this family is a family and not just made up family. You know? We had to make sure of that. And that took us time. One, you know, to deal with one set would take two to three hours. A whole day would go nothing but asking and minding whether we are really doing something right, whether they are families or not. And there were many families who came, loaded with their wealth, loaded with jewellery, and some with just a bundle. You were very brave. Me? I I would come home and vomit and (laughs) fall sick and cover myself and go to bed. (laughs) But then after that, I worked for almost six weeks, six to two months I worked. Then every, then I said, okay, now you people do, I, I'm not handling it. Especially the women who were, but young girls, 18, 19, were brutally raped. Oh, oh my, you could see the bus swollen like that. Bitten, bitten with teeth, teeth marks all over the nipple. Terrible. You, you felt the first time I fainted on on her only. I couldn't bear it. We we had to do it. If we don't do it, then who would have done it? Looking back on it now, how do you feel? Oh, I feel that I was glad that I did something, was able to do something in my life for them. Then, of course, I back to my Harding. The biggest blunder I ever made in my life was that I was offered to go to London to be well trained as a welfare officer, which I didn't go, because I was in love with the boy and I thought I mustn't leave him, somebody else may take him. And that is where 
I made a blunder in my life. That was the biggest, biggest blunder I ever made in my life was that. Was that the, the boy that you married? No. No, I did not get that boy in spite of my, as my friend said, you were a fool. You stayed back and what did you get in your reward? You should have gone. I said, yes, now it's too late. How do you feel about the fact that when men make decisions about countries' futures, it's the women who suffer? Well, I feel it's too difficult to answer that question, but I do feel what was there was something which I can't explain. Do you feel a sense of injustice that women have been so badly treated for so long? Yes. I mean, I felt that there were no human beings. Even an animal would be better than a human being. That's the way I feel. I feel that uh, uh, a female big female dog is far better on a street than the poor young girl of 16 and 17. Really, I swear, I honestly tell you, it was too much. Young girls were completely finished, who ran away out of fright, leaving everybody behind. And there were families who well came and were very well settled, they worked. But, mind you, I always admire these Punjabis, though as a rule I don't much care for Punjabis. A Sardar is a much better person, much better person to deal with every walk of life than a Punjabi. But whereas work goes, they never beg. They work and they eat their own. They eat their own. And how well, even when when they when people came, there was a doctor who came with all his equipments, and he was to build. He took all these people who were helpless, helping them, working them, paying them, feeding them. You know, he built up his, up his own house, set up everything. But he would see that his own brotherhood gets something, and this is the way what Delhi is today. Then government gave everybody land. Each so many Lajpat Nagar, you see, so many places that side, Naraina, all those government had given plots and they built whoever had brought money. Then there were friends who had houses here and who had houses there. So they exchanged. The houses were exchanged. They took theirs there and they took theirs there. That's fine. Auntie, thank you. A tragedy which you can never ever forget. And the old ladies, to see their young girls being ruined like this, how much they felt, how much they felt. Auntie, what was Delhi like then? What was happening in Delhi? In Delhi, a lot of riots lot of riots amongst the people now Trukman Gate, lot of riot, a Muslim, full Muslim area. Even today it is a Muslim area. Oh, people were just slaughtered, slaughtered, nothing but slaughtered. And then uh, we were staying and we were not allowed to go down. And we, for eight days, we did not have milk or anything fresh, vegetables as such. And the army people used to come, they block-wise, that time we were many residents in Delhi, in the North Place, take us to the grocery shop, or they themselves would, another man, bring dal, chawal, sugar, and that was all, or milk powder, as much as they could get. And that was the only time when we learned to drink tea without milk. The Vinkman never came, no vegetables came. 
So each one, we were all in the, each one trying to share each one's thing. We had little, they would give us rice, we would give them dal, and that's the way. You know, across the roof we would go. We, uh, our roof is just one roof which can go opposite plaza. So we were all there, we used to exchange things, or we used to get together, cook one dish and eat together. And that is how we spent ten different days without any fresh thing. And my papa used to work in Old Delhi Lahori Gate Powerhouse. So he was escorted, but for four days he was not, he didn't come to the house. They just couldn't come. So he was in the powerhouse himself. in the truck, then he said, now you go and buy whatever you like, I will take your dog out for a walk. So my dog used to have walked there with the army officer, then I would bring my stuff, then he would bring my dog bag and take us home, bring us upstairs. Here. From your balcony here in Common yeah, Place, in do you see trouble then? Oh yes, lot of trouble. Oh, how the shops were destroyed and how people looted. I. People used to ch just load themselves, shoes of no size, and then some would uh, nicely take up and try. I would, I collected few stones, and I would throw a stone on him. Put that, put it in that shop again. Were these just Muslim shops or any shop? And then they started looting any shop. For just, everybody had an opportunity. Chalo up, we'll all do it. That was the way. Name Muslim, but the others were also looted. We we are still about five, six old shops here where we meet. And we have we have our Connaught Place Association, then the Traders Association, then we have Ladies Kitty Party. So we are st we are few now. We have one sixty five residents in first. First floor and second floor were residents and ground floor were shops. Now everything has changed. Now I don't know how long we will be in this house, that God only knows. Auntie, who were the people doing the writing? Who were these people who were looting? They were just gangsters and really educated people also, school students. Big tan, tan, you know, they used to get there, and load them and go, run. They would go and come back, go and come back. And I wondered where they would go and come back. Where are they putting it? But then I was not allowed to go down. What is we, we had a Dogara regiment who was looking after Connaught Place at that time. And so that site was the order. So we were not allowed to go down at all. Only army people would take us and bring us back. But how come the army didn't shoot these people? Who were that looting? when everything was completely finished, then they came in. Were there Sikhs and Hindus who were doing basically the rioting? No, Sikhs never. Hindus, Muslims, each one. Nobody. See, here the killing, the Muslims were brutal slaughtered. There the Hindus were slaughtered on both the sides, both the sides. Nobody spared no, excepting friends. Now, uh, opposite us there was a Muslim family, which my papa brought. We brought them here and kept them. Then we managed to get the air ticket, and but then there were people who became like they would say, "All right, give us three necklaces, give us yes, uh, twelve bangles. We will do something for you and put you on the flight." This was the way how people became, how they were looted, and how, how they wanted to run from here. Of course, our daily powerhouse, uh, the, uh, the bosses made arrangements for their staff to be escorted up to the border. Where did this Muslim family go? This the Muslim, they went to uh, Multan. Are you in touch with them? No, not in touch with them. 
and my, my my cousin went to Pakistan because he was in the Baluch regiment, and one cousin stayed in India because he was in Rajputana Rifles. So he stayed in India, and the man who was in Baluch, he went to Pakistan. See, a Parsi family was split by partition. Yes. Oh, that many, many have been split. Many have. Quite a lot. I have my cousins, and there are so many yet where their people are in Pakistan. But Pakistan always had very, very... They were in very, very well-to-do people, very rich. But now there are very few left. Auntie, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.